Well, each year my favorite plenary is the one where we hear from one of our own. C'est l'honneur de présenter le Dr. D. Mangin. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. D. Mangin, a family physician. Before moving from New Zealand to Canada, D. was director of the primary care unit at the University of Otago Christchurch and clinical leader for research audit and evaluation at the Pegasus Health Primary Healthcare Organization. Dr. Mangan was also a ministerially appointed member of the New Zealand Pharmaceutical and Therapeutics Products Advisory Committee, is a fellow of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practitioners, and in 2011 received their Distinguished Service Medal. She currently holds the David Braley Chair in Family Medicine at McMaster University. Dr. Mangan also sits on the Section of Researchers Council within the College of Family Physicians of Canada, and she is also the Director of Music great acronym, the McMaster University Sentinel and Information Collaboration, PBRN, and is the medical director and co-founder of risk.org, rxisk.org, a website for consumer information and reporting of drug adverse reactions. Her broad research interests include rational prescribing, innovative models of primary care delivery, effective incorporation of evidence into patient-centered practice, and the influences of science, policy, and commerce on the nature of care. Dr. D. Mangan is one of the Canada's leading primary care researchers, and I'm delighted to welcome her to the podium. Bonjour, Madame et Monsieur. As you can tell instantly from the moment I open my mouth, I'm not from around here. One of my patients when I started in practice in Canada four years ago said to me, oh doctor, you've just got irritable bowel syndrome. <laughs> and being from not around these parts, I wanted to take a moment to thank you all. Um, I came here from the other side of the world and this group has been extraordinary in its welcome and its openness um, and its collaborative and non-competitive approach. So I'm very proud to be an immigrant amongst you. Primary care for me is the real world of research. Um, it's where the action is. Most of the activity happens in primary care and as we've heard um, said so eloquently throughout this conference, it's where the strongest evidence for effect on health comes, outcomes is. One of the great things about clinical practice is that with every patient that comes through the consultation room, research questions fly by. So research in clinical practice is a constant state of wonder. And this is the kind of typical Monday morning of wondering these patients all represent things that have made me wonder over the years and where wondering has turned to answering, often presented at these meetings. John Berwick raised recently the idea that medicine is about to move into its third era. He's called this the moral era of medicine. And I think that medicine's next era is probably embodied in the wondering about the last two patients you see there in the morning. And I know many others are wondering about these same things. And I want to share uh, some of that wondering with you because I think it provides a good lens for a primary care perspective on medicine's next era and what opportunities it opens for us in research. So looking at eras past, era one reflected the rise of the medical profession and among its norms were these, honor, special knowledge inaccessible to consumers, beneficence, independence of influences of commerce and the state, and in, in return, society gave us a privilege, the ability to judge the quality of our own work and produce our own body of knowledge. But the idealism of this first era was shaken by examination that showed paternalism, enormous variation in practice, injury from care errors high enough to be a public health menace, indignities and injustice related to ethnicity and social class and profiteering. 
era two dominates our present framework for care. And era two is about measurement and reporting and accountability and efficiency, based very much on the models of efficiency and standardization from, the, from industrial um, models. It's also characterized by an imbalance of specialism to generalism. Polypharmacy and its drivers, I think, provide a very useful lens to understand the influences on the health system in era two, particularly in primary care, and a way to think about and conceptualize the third era and what opportunities there are for primary care and primary care research. So this is the problem. We need to talk about drugs. And this is not the drug problem we've been reading about in the media lately, but it is an equally big drug problem that probably represents the biggest opportunity we have to improve medical care in older age in the next 30 years. Meet Anne. She's one of the last two patients in the consultation. She's a real patient. They all are. Anne had a fall at home. And you can see her medications on the right there. And this scenario is very familiar to everybody. Your patient, you, your mother or father, is on multiple pills at multiple times of the day. A blister pack might be used to try to keep things on track and reduce the confusion. And why is this a problem, really? These are all good medicines supported by good evidence, and they re represent our advances in medical care. Surely if you need the pill, you need the pill. But it's a little like music. If we listen to some bark, some Miles Davis, of course Leonard Cohen, Come over to the, wind. the Four Tops, Also Bruce Springsteen, on their own, they sound wonderful and they do us good. We feel better. But what happens when we play them all together? And this is what it's like for patients on multiple medications as they're added through their lifetime. This is an uncomfortable fact that in Europe, where we have the best data, more people die of adverse drug effects every year than die of colon cancer or of breast cancer or of prostate cancer. It's the equivalent in Europe of two jumbo jets full of people crashing every day and killing everybody on board. If this was an airline, would you fly on it? The whole fleet would be grounded until the system issues were sorted out. But our patients fly on this airline every day. This cause of death is largely invisible in the focus on epidemics of disease or the need to treat risk factors. In Canada, over one in 10 people on five or more medicines have a drug side effect that requires medical attention in every year. Invisible in all our measures of quality care, this causes more harm than many of the diseases the drugs are designed to treat. There are no measures in place to prevent death and illness from this much more common cause. More people are admitted to hospital because of low blood sugar now than from the treatments, sorry, low blood sugar from the treatments for diabetes than high blood sugar itself. Hypoglycemia is an outcome that really matters to patients. Even one significant hypoglycemia in a patient with type 2 diabetes increases the risk for dementia. The other study shows that older patients on blood pressure medicines are much more likely to suffer a serious injury from a fall than their neighbour who is not. 
So there's a huge opportunity here for gains for patients in the new era of care and for health budgets for every one million older adults that cost $27 million every year in the costs of preventable adverse drug events. But this doesn't mean a new treatment or a new cure. It means a paradigm shift. Medicine is all about doing. In medicine's next era, we will fo focus on the art of not doing well. Polypharmacy is also associated with some quite specific problems. Polypharmacy, as you can see, makes you dizzy, drowsy, and dull thinking, with obvious implications for community mobility and social isolation. And we see exactly the same thing in animal models of polypharmacy. In older animals, single drugs are no problem on their own, but together they result in reduced mobility, balance, and strength. And it's not just wasteful in these harmful effects, but it also wastes effectiveness. When the number of pills leads to confusion, it's often impossible to take them all, which could be protective, but in the chaos, the pills that may be of most benefit to this patient may be the ones that are skipped. And the photograph on the right is an example from a home visit to a 72-year-old woman. Despite having a blister pack, these were the pills that she was simply unable to cope with taking. The burden of care that we had imposed was too great. There are also signals that these effects might be reversible. In this work we did a few years ago, we took secondary, 70 consecutive older adults and trialled stopping and monitoring of all life essential drugs to see if they were still needed, reintroducing them if they were. But this wasn't an RCT. As you can see, it indicated for the first time that there may well be health benefits to reducing polypharmacy. But we need more work in randomised trials to actually show to what extent these negative effects are reversible. Polypharmacy also provides a lens on health equity. In reviewing the contributions that clinical care can and can't make to health equity a few years ago, we suggested a list of potential system indicators for health equity, and one of these is drug adverse reactions. Deprived populations are much more vulnerable to polypharmacy, and they're also least able to respond to adverse drug effects when they suffer from them. Polypharmacy has other equity implications. There's great interest in the use of e-health in simplifying managing chronic conditions for patients. But what do patients think about this? We asked around 800 consecutive patients attending our PBRN clinics whether they were interested in e-health as part of their care. And of these significant, six significant predictors in the univariate analysis, only two remained significant in the multivariate analysis as predictors of disinterest in e-health. Access, which is associated with deprivation and low literacy, but also polypharmacy. And this is not, as you can see, related to either competence or age or even self-rated health. So the inverse care law is likely to increase health inequity for patients with polypharmacy. Victor Montori has eloquently articulated a new approach to medicine, minimally disruptive medicine, which aims to ensure this burden of care doesn't exceed the individual's capacity to cope. Yet we've only moved from compliance to adherence in our language about medications. In era three, can we now move to self-efficacy and patient-prioritised care. Examining the influences from era one and two that led us to this situation are useful in framing our research wonderings for era three in primary care. This is the original concept of EBM, and you'll see it balances in equal measure clinical expertise, um, the patient's state and circumstances, and their priorities for care. In parallel with era two, evidence-based medicine developed out of the pushback against professionalism, paternalism, variation, and to protect us against quack treatments, which were all much needed. But it's useful to reflect on some of the unintended consequences. EBM has been captured to some extent by the accountability and market theory of era two in a way that was never intended by its creators. It's been used as a tool for measurement reductionism and targets 
And it plays into our fears as generalists of not knowing enough or being found wanting. The single disease guidelines as targets model of care broke open Dave Sackett's original idea of EBM. In era two, the evidence becomes disconnected from the patient's clinical state and circumstances and their priorities, with the idea that if care can be standardised to doing what the research says, outcomes would be better for all, and the integrator, clinical expertise, is lost. We like the Japanese car production efficiency models. The aim is for standardisation and treatment of each disease. Healthcare increasingly structured like individual production lines for all patients with diabetes or with heart disease. So that it doesn't matter who does it as long as it gets done and that every patient, like every car, will be both perfect and identical at the end. But patients are neither perfect nor identical. The combination of illnesses and their manifest manifestation and symptoms is very variable and they experience both these and the effects of their treatments inseparably and simultaneously. Like the oil in the engine mixing with the water in the radiator of the car, this disconnected model of care when converted to adherence to targets doesn't work for our patients with complex multimorbidity. This in turn gave rise to technovigilance as a mechanism for accountability, estimating the proportions of patients with a particular condition that are receiving treatment X or Z. Pay for performance schemes became popular. Have they met with mixed results and responses and intense debate in primary care? Targets are often surrogates and single diseases rather than more sophisticated measures of primary care system function are used. There have been mixed effects on equity and access and a negative effect on continuity of care. A negative effect on patient centeredness has also been seen, highlighting the opportunity costs along with a lack of the anticipated benefit on patient relevant outcomes. Era two has also reflected a time where commercial in interests increasingly control our body of knowledge and the access to it. This bias becomes concentrated in meta-analyses that can only see the published literature. And this is the Cipriani meta-analysis of um, the SSRI antidepressants that my residents always quote to me when discussing treatments for depression. And you can see that these are the studies that were used in that meta-analysis. And this is a, a, a now famous paper by Eric Turner, who worked for the FDA as a reviewer. And what he observed was that the studies in the published literature around antidepressants were much less than the studies that he had observed as a reviewer coming to the FDA for licensing. And so he analyzed, uh, analyzed them by effect. This is the effect you see in the studies in the published literature. But when he looked at the studies in the, all the studies submitted to the FDA, this is what he saw. A vast difference in the estimation of the effect of these medications. And this is not particular to SSRIs. This, the evidence is that this kind of bias exists across all our body of knowledge. These biases become obscured in guidelines provided by specialist focus groups. And these have risen to a status of some kind of sacred monster of medical care. We feel uneasy if we don't follow them, even if we're making treatment plans that are most likely to improve the health of the individual with polypharmacy. But healthcare funders and administrators can often see guidelines as proxies for good care and their standard implementation as the best way to improve health. And here's a well-known example of an analysis by Cynthia Boyd of the way guidelines make polypharmacy inevitable. If you give a woman who's 70 what an average woman her age might have, and you'll notice there are two diseases here that actually interfere with her function, her osteoarthritis and her COPD, and three that she has because we've told her as a good doctor that she has them. <laughs> this is what happens. This example was published in 2005, and I want to use it to illustrate another thing, the lag time between evidence of effectiveness and evidence of harm. I updated this for something I was writing last year and went through this list of drugs, side effects and interactions between drugs and diseases. 
the potential for harm has now risen to 16. You can see in this example the cracks in the current way of understanding good medicine. In era two, we find ourselves in a predicament in primary care where it's perversely possible to provide care that's measurably better in terms of guideline adherence and performance, but can be meaningfully worse for individual patients. But the good news is that what it also says that in era three, for good medicine that's good for your health, you need good doctors. Because while prescribers turn chemicals into medicines, a wise, person-focused, generalist approach is what turns them into good medicines. The question for era three is, do we try to improve guidelines for multi morbidity? Martin Fortin and Victor Montori's work has shown that they're not fit for purpose for use in multi-morbidity at the moment. Do we improve them? Or given the heterogeneous nature of multi-morbidity, do we need to find a radically different way to synthesize knowledge? This disease-based vertical view is congruent with specialist models, but it's not congruent with a person-focused horizontal view that we see in everyday generalist primary care practice, taking into account all aspects of illness and context. And as a result, we do a lot of workarounds. But workarounds are gifts for us in research. They identify when systems are not working, and they shine the light on the shifts that are needed at system level in era three. Another influence that's grown in parallel to era two is what sociologists such as Ulrich Beck have called the risk society. And during the industrial and modern eras, people grew confident that scientific and technical progress would enable humans to control the natural world and their own destiny. And in medicine, epidemiology could be used to create risk for almost every condition. <laughs> Reinforced when government agencies use fear to drive behavior like this. The sociologist Zygmunt Bauman summarized this piercingly well. The big carcass of mortality has been sliced from head to tail into the rashes of fearful, yet curable, or potentially curable, afflictions. They can be now fit neatly into every nook and cranny of life. Now the whole of life serves the purpose of war against cause of death. The permanent horror can only be dispelled in the bustle of doing something about it. The outcome is an excessive preoccupation with the risk of death, as if what was at stake was more than replacing one cause of death with another. So let's examine this idea. This slide is a slide since the mid-1600s of the most common causes of death, and I want to illustrate two things with this slide. The first is that there's no doubt that public health and advances in medical care have been important. You can see the decline in premature death from an infectious disease really clearly. And there's no doubt also that preventing premature death from chronic disease has been an important and effective endeavor as you see the effect we've had on heart disease. The second thing I want to illustrate is that at any one point in this timeline, all of these lines add up to 100%. We must all die of something. So as, as one disease fades, another rises to take its place as the most common cause of death. And the aim of prevention is to turn this survival curve into a rectangle to aim to allow all of us to achieve a normal life expectancy for a human body. And this is what's happening in developed countries. But what happens when we apply prevention as the survival curve turns to a rectangle at the end of that rectangle? Is it possible that we'll simply shift cause of death without improving life? It's a bit like a car or any car I've ever owned. It goes along fine for about 10 years and then everything all goes wrong at the same time, very expensively. And if the radiator has a hole and the alternator's broken and there's a, there's a, a leak in the, in the oil tank, the car won't go any better or faster if I just fix the clutch. We can use a couple of examples to examine this using data. So this is the example of cholesterol drugs over age 70. This is the only prospective randomized trial of statins in this age group. And you can see here um, in the forest plot um, 
that it looks like there's a positive effect in terms of the combined cardiovascular outcomes that would support this conclusion in the paper. So we need to be using these drugs in the same way as for younger people. But when we look, took the data and plotted it for other causes of death, this is what you see. There's no change in all-cause mortality. And in fact, when you look at the other most common cause of death and illness, you can see that the, the decrease in cardiovascular um, combined endpoint is balanced by a rise in cancer, death, and diagnosis. So there's neither compression of, of mor morbidity nor a change in mortality. Yet if we tell a patient, if you take this drug, you'll reduce your risk of cardiovascular death or illness by 15%, they would naturally expect to live better and longer. This is not peculiar to statins. You see exactly the same effect if you look at the effect of colorectal cancer screening in older age. Older age has very more, many more threats to it than are captured by disease rate counting and risk, illustrated poignantly by these paintings from my high school art teacher, Trevor Moffat. Loneliness and boredom. Are we further blighting old age with medical care? We have to be very careful when we introduce the idea of risk to a patient, captured by the last patient on my Monday morning, Mary, who used to, who's um, 93, I saw her when I was in my first year in practice, and she used to only come for her medicals, for her driver's license, so that she could take meals on wheels to the elderly. Mary went into hospital for a carpal tunnel release, Somebody did some blood work and started her on a statin. And Mary came to me transformed with anxiety about her heart condition. And that memory has stayed with me for all these decades since. It's a little bit like adding a drop of ink to the clear water of the patient's identity, which will never be completely clear again. And this study demonstrates it clearly. This is a study from Scandinavia that showed that people who had high blood sugar, high blood pressure, or abnormal thyroid tests had rated themselves as poorer on health status measures when they were aware of these diseases than people who had exactly the same measures who were not aware of them. We're also unclear about what to do with risk in our ageing population. Risk doesn't work the same in older age. And there's this very nice study that reapplies the framing and risk equation in a cohort of older adults and found that it didn't predict cardiovascular outcomes in the same way. Things that were once risks act differently in older age and they compete, as you saw in the statin example, but we continue to treat based on non-generalizable evidence. And our tendency to therapeutic positivism comes into play here as well. And this is a fact that I always find very uncomfortable. Most of the people that we're giving medicines to aren't benefiting from them. In order for half of the people to benefit, the NNT has to be two or less. And there are few, if any, medicines that meet that criteria. And compounding this is a concept called technological brinkmanship, Coin termed by, um, uh, term coined by an ethicist called Daniel Callahan from the US, where everybody knows that a point is reached where enough is enough, but no one's quite sure when that point is reached, so treatments continue to be added until death. The second sh paradigm shift facing us then in this new era is countering our therapeutic imperative that runs through medical care, but without losing hope or being nihilistic. Our medical system is predicated on doing things. A patient comes with a problem, we do something. We order a test, we give a treatment, adding more and more to the patient during their lifetime. And measures of quality of care are also all about the number of times we do something. We have no framework yet for not doing things or stopping them, or for valuing this. So much so that it almost seems we've forgotten how. And this example shows how far the pendulum has swung. So polypharmacy is a really good marker 
for the cracks in the system in era two, like tidying up music into its component parts. This is what happens when we tidy up patients into their component diseases or drugs. The loss of meaning and context makes it impossible to hear the melodies of the patient's life and to provide care that will enhance it. Are we brave enough to move from our comfort zone to address this? It will take nerve and courage and innovative research to leave and leap into this void to move from wondering to answering these questions. Don Berwick calls this coming era the moral era. I would call it the era of the generalist. Because I think, and I hope what you see is what I see here, is these, in these cracks in the system is a failure to prioritise support and value the generalist primary care approach. Era three needs a rebalancing of specialism and generalism, a rebalancing of risk and prevention, and a shift to the center of the person rather than the disease. The way we assess treatments must change also. The average number of medicines taken by people over 65 in most developed countries is now seven. And we know that clinical trials don't include people with multiple illnesses or taking multiple drugs. So we're actually in the middle of an enormous global experiment with no data collection. We've shifted our way of looking at treatments before in response to other challenges. The first ever pre-market placebo-controlled trial was um, carried out by Louis Lasagna in Rochester, New York. Does anyone know what that drug is? It was thalidomide. And the trial found it was very effective. The important effects of thalidomide were only discovered later through doctors observing what happened to people in the real world. And this will be vital in our next era. Our model of care is so focused on comparative effectiveness of medicines that like thalidomide, we know about little about safety and efficacy in the real world if and until we use data from real populations in which they're used. Without this information, clinicians and patients don't have what they need to make decisions about treatments. As a response to the problem of thalidomide, there was a massive shift in the way that drugs were researched and licensed. The response to the prevalence of multimorbidity and the problems of polypharmacy create the opportunity for an equally massive shift. Primary care is the ideal context to provide the practice-based evidence that's needed. Now, some might say it's too hard to do drug trials in primary care, but yes, we can, and we can do them differently. This is a trial we did of antidepressants in uh, long-term use, the antidepressant cessation trial. What we did was we took a group of several hundred old adults who'd been taking them for some years for maintenance to prevent recurrence. And they fit the guidelines for maintenance treatment. And we randomized half to taper to placebo and the other half to carry on. And we followed them for 18 months. What this shows is that it's perfectly possible for a group of GPs to do a clinical trial of a question that's important to them. And what it shows in red here is that patients are very keen to partner with us when it's an important question for them as well. And the second thing I wanted to use this to flag was the usefulness of discontinuation designs in primary care. By randomly discontinuing drugs and observing if they're placebo masked, we can look at both effectiveness and safety in people with multimorbidity and people who've been using medications long term. And these are the results. Mm. Over 18 months, the absolute difference was only 12%. This is much lower than the stated benefit of maintenance treatment. One in eight benefited, but seven in eight did not. And importantly, one in 16 people who'd been taking these medicines long term, even with a long taper, and even using fluoxetine, had withdrawal symptoms that were severe. This is the kind of information that people, patients need to make decisions on taking treatments long term. We can use also our PBRN data to understand much more about how polypharmacy happens 
what the contributors are. Legacy drugs um, is a term we started using to describe drugs that aren't short term like antibiotics, they're long enough term to need repeat prescriptions and they're appropriate in initiation and when prescribed for an intermediate term, but they assume legacy status when they're not appropriately discontinued. We used our PBRN data to look at a few of these legacy drugs. We chose three groups, antidepressants and PPIs that have been continued for more than a year, bisphosphonates that have been continued to, for more than five years, to see what contribution this legacy prescribing might be um, adding to polypharmacy. And this is what we found. We found that most people prescribe these drugs, actually prescribe them in these longer terms that, that might indicate that prescribing is beyond the period of benefit. And we also found an opportunity that most people with this legacy status were still taking them. Now you might suggest audit and feedback as a mechanism for improving care, but this is a workaround and my sense is that we're becoming increasingly burdened with these lists of patients and oughts of problems like this that we have to attend to across a range of issues. I think what this shows is that our system is really good for starting medicines, but it's not really good for stopping, and so this is a real opportunity for some system design and intervention research. There's also much needed domain specific research. You can see here the list of tools that'll be familiar with you to try and address polypharmacy. So as a reaction to some of the difficulties, there's been this kind of drug focused approach, and these lists can be very helpful tools, but they're not the answer, because it's possible to be on 12 medications and none of them be on these lists. We know that they only predict about a quarter of hospital admissions from drug side effects. And we really lack evidence at the moment about the extent to which application can improve outcomes that matter to patients. Like disease-based care, they still map awkwardly onto primary care. They're not responsive to the complexity and heterogeneity of the patient with multimorbidity and nor to their priorities. There's other work being done on how and when to stop medicines, what's appropriate and what's inappropriate polypharmacy. The Canadian Deprescribing Network and networks in other jurisdictions and many researchers in this room are working hard on developing this knowledge base. But we also need to understand the system shifts in era three that will avoid these problems ever happening. This is Jorge Luis Boyce a famous Argentinian writer of short stories, essays, and poetry. He was blind from early on in his life, and this gave him an extraordinary ability to see and describe things in a different way. He wrote in one, a one-paragraph short story here about the absurdity of detailed recording for its own sake. In era two, the requirements for recording shifted from a way of recording meaning of the consultation to a line of defense and a method for monitoring that carries with it a certain loss of trust. These notes are often used as a proxy for what happens in our consultations, but we know that this map does not reflect the territory of the patient or the conversation of bearing witness to suffering of nuanced discussions. The screen grab of Google Earth illustrates the way in which a complete technological map can still fail in rendering a complete truth. There are no clouds and there's no nighttime in Google's Earth. And in understanding what makes a life worth living, the answer to this is as heterogeneous as our individuals. In primary care, we are articulate clearly the difference between the map and the territory, but in the map of the encounter between clinicians and patient, there is much reported. If you look at your EMR, what's striking is what's visible and what's not. There is much visible on diseases, drugs, and measurements, but there is little of the person visible. We can assign you a code if you're injured in a spaceship accident, as Ruth Wilson showed us the other day. But where are the patient priorities and preferences that there is so much rhetoric about in our talk of person-focused care. The information that tells us for that patient what a life worth living means to them. So here is one of our challenges, our way forward, and I know there are groups working on this already. 
These wonderful and energetic people have just done a systematic review of the literature to look for tools that might help. And I'm putting an image of this paper up because for all of them it was their first ever published paper. They looked for tools that might be helpful to us in designing a model for polypharmacy, um, in, in making visible patient priorities and preferences and what the effect was on outcomes. At the end of all that searching of thousands of papers, all they found was one part of one tool that might be suitable. So we went on to ask patients about their experiences to understand how we might go about this. And this is what they told us. And I found this quite challenging as a clinician to think that this is how my world looks to patients. These cracks in the system from the patient's perspective both appear in primary care but also in fragmentation across the system. The patient is left managing the different views of their different clinicians and being the proxy communicator between them. And these are their responses to the situation they find themselves in. Self-experimentation, not in partnership with pause and monitor on their own. And these were their perspectives on how we should go about approaching polypharmacy. That they're the experts, actually, in how drugs work and don't work for them. That they understand the necessary the necessity for trade-offs. That they want someone to coordinate for them rather than having the burden of doing it themselves. But they also highlighted in the current system the need for strong advocacy to get what they want from medical care. We need to share with these experts the information they want. This website which we designed to provide access to information for consumers on medication side effects um, and to assist clinicians now gets over 200,000 visits per month. There's a huge appetite for this kind of information. The work of France Lagarde and the KR group have also advanced us mightily in how to go about shared decision making. In conversations with groups of patients in New Zealand and in Canada that mirror the work of many others trying to understand how best to make decisions about treatments, patients told us that understanding what they need from medicines is embedded in us asking them these kinds of questions. Patients are really keen to be involved as partners in their care and to be engaged in these conversations with us. And as Emily Reeves' work shows us, in countries across the world, most patients, if asked, would like to take less medicines. The other thing that this research showed us when we asked both doctors and patients about what are the barriers to addressing this problem of polypharmacy is a key theme came out of fear. Patients told us we'd like to take less medication. We think you doctors prescribe too much. And we think, over half of us think stopping pills now and then is a good idea, a drug holiday. But we're afraid to initiate conversations about this because we worry about what you'll think and we want to be able to restart a drug again if we're trial stopping and we're worried that you won't let us. Doctors worry about giving the wrong impression by starting the conversation. We worry about a lack of a system to approach stopping medications and guidance for this and we worry about not following single disease guidelines. So it's just easier to carry on. We seem to have lost our clinical courage somewhere. So we took this work and the work of our feasibility study and all of these other building blocks to test a model that might be suitable for use in, as routine preventive care in older adults. And this is my, before I die, if we, if we can see some kind of system to address this problem as part of our routine prevention, then I'll be happy. This is a model which fosters partnership between the generalist primary care disciplines most interested in this issue, pharmacy and family physicians, and the crucial third partner, patients. It's supported by current evidence and tools for deprescribing, but it's driven by patient priorities. Because addressing polypharmacy without an understanding of what the patient wants or doesn't want is impossible. 
and we're pretty excited about the emerging results. We've seen people that have gone from not being able to give consent at the beginning of the, the study and having relatives do it for them to being completely lucid and able to give their own consent within a few weeks. We've seen patients who are confused become lucid and we've seen patients who are falling stop. But there are much more nuanced aspects to understand. The artist Kerry Scabada has produced a series of self-portraits of himself falling. In the instance of slipping, he says, there's a moment of stillness before you lose control. And it's a reference to the philosopher Martin Heidegger, who describes life as perpetually falling. The gaze of the falling man could be on what he's about to crash into, or, or out to sea, on the gloriousness of the view in the moment of stillness. And in some ways, the idea of a life worth living is about focusing on the gloriousness of the view rather than the inevitability for all of us of the end of the fall. In medicine's third era, how can we understand and value this beyond the reductionism of quality of life metrics? Young and Cullen made these, this observation after working um, on death in conversations with Londoners there are indications that satisfaction, that contentment, that happiness are not related to the absolute level of health, but rather to the gap between expectation and reality. The work of chronic illness is relief of suffering, to the extent that that's possible. And it's often in helping patients adjust their expectations so that they can be met, so that in that moment of stillness between slipping and falling, they can focus on the view. There is so much still to understand about this and how we integrate this into individual care. At a system level, there are opportunities to align the measurement domains for quality primary care in a way that they are really congruent with the core aspects that we know that improve health and that are congruent with the primary care generalist model and not with diseases or drug focus. And Rick Glazier and Carol Mulder are grappling with this in Canada. One of the things I really love about Canada is skiing in the trees. We don't have trees on the ski fields in New Zealand. And so when I first tried um, here, I just seemed to keep skiing into the trees. And I talked to one of the Canadian mountain hosts about this, and he said to me, and this is, this is a metaphor for many other things in life, he said, it's because you're looking at the trees. If you look at the light between the trees, it will be completely different. And it was. A new paradigm is emerging from primary care, cautionary prevention, or P4. And this describes actions to reduce the burden and harms of excess care. But how do we value and make this kind of good care visible in quality measures? How do we look at the light between the trees? Between eras one and two, we moved from a high to a low trust system. Variation in care has been seen as a kind of dirty word that implies variable quality. However, some of this variation is a healthy essential in translating the partial statistical lives of trial participants into person-focused care in the real lives of patients to provide the health care that's best for them. How do we move to a system that supports both trust and quality? There are questions of balance between risk mongering and our important role in prevention, between data that informs and data that disables, between generalism and specialism, patient priorities, medical knowledge. So not only do we need primary care, we need primary care research now more than ever. And we need these cracks, because observing these cracks are a gift. Because as Leiden and Cohen observed, there is a crack in everything. It's how the light gets in. So thank you for the great honour of speaking with you today. And I'm happy to hear. I've not questions because I've asked most of the questions, but I'm very happy to, to hear your own wonderings and thoughts. Thank you.
I think, Mark, we have a few time, a, a little bit of time for people to come to the microphone and, and, and share their own thoughts, I think. And I can't see anything, so. Hi, I'm Guillaume Charbonneau. I'm the president of the College of Family Physician of Canada. I want to congratulate you for this wonderful talk. It was very, very interesting. And, and I want to congratulate you also for the courage to enter this kind of fight because it will need a lot to go in this, this fourth era that you, you suggest. And, and probably you have some tip for us because the, the New Zealand team of rugby still beat our women team. So probably there's some, some courage that need to be brought from, from New Zealand to Canada. And, and I thank you for that. And I think it speaks to, uh, to the leadership that family medicine and primary care need to, to bring to, to, the, to the healthcare system because um, I think we don't have control of what we do. Um, and it, it, it can be reflected by everything that you told us this morning, but also by uh, other group like, like Mike Allen group and, and doctor from, from Edmonton who, who, who remember us that we have no control over our practice. We have guidelines that tell us what to do that came from very specialist uh, oriented uh, way of thinking of care. And if we follow all those guidelines, not to feel the culpability at night when we are at home, we, we would take 18 hours a day working on the, those prevention and all those things for chronic disease that they tell us to do. And we won't have no time to listen to the complaint of our patient, the reason why they come in our office and we have, where we have uh, a lot more impact on, on their quality of life. So I want to thank you for that. I don't know if it's a question, but it's a comment that I needed to do. And, and I take this opportunity to, to, to thank Snap Craig to organize this, this kind of, of meeting where we can learn so much. Thank you very much. I agree with you entirely. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, the reason that I think that uh, primary care is so well positioned to, to lead in the next era is because we've always been the innovators, you know, from the time of Edward Jenner, who observed what happened in his, his practice and, and acted on it and tried things out. And we've also always been comfortable with uncertainty. So I think that with the generalist view and these kind of qualities, we are perfectly positioned to lead medicine in its next era. Pauline Buxtans, um, I'm a family doctor from Belgium, uh, working on research in multimorbidity. Thank you, Dr. Mengen, for a great talk. Um, I have a question. Um, I've been working on goal-oriented care, which is uh, uh, care uh, driven by the patient goals. Um, my question is, we all use slightly different words for the same um, basic concept. We've heard Maurice Stewart yesterday about patient-centered care. Um, if you look at Tinetti's work, um, she used to call it goal-oriented care, then now she calls it patient-priority-directed decision-making, which you have mentioned in your talk. Um, if we want to move these ideas forward, I think we need a common name, what would you suggest, or do you think we don't need this to um, move this forward in the literature? I think, I think that's a really great um, point, and I'm glad you raised it, because I think, um, I think there are nuanced levels of this kind of concept. I think there's um, goal-oriented care and shared decision-making can often be directed at a particular symptom or condition or around a decision to take a particular drug or not, and sometimes that um, part of that is just representing in an understandable way um, the evidence so that the patient can make choices. Um, and then there are, there are a kind of life goals of what the patient wants to achieve. But then there are a kind of patient priorities. So we, we found a lot of work that had been done on patient priorities within single conditions. You know, people with renal failure, did they want to have a transplant or, or in dialysis or not? Those kinds of things. But there's, there's also a sort of cross-cutting concept of general priorities for care that was captured in that quote from Sir Theodore Fox that, that um, and I can think of a married couple who are patients of mine where she wants to take every drug available to keep herself alive as long as possible. So she's on maximum primary prevention for cardiovascular disease despite looking at the, at the kind of evidence. Whereas her husband 
who has had stents and has significant arterial disease, is not interested. When my time's up, my time's up, he says. And I, I'm, you know, I, I, I used to have, I'm going to give his identity away too much if I describe him, but um, uh, I used to have all these sort of lifestyle conditions that I know, I know sort of made me have these things, and now I don't because I've adjusted my life, and so I don't want those medicines, thanks, and if I d die early, that's fine. And so it's those kind of cross-cutting priorities are a different concept as well. But I agree, it's, it's very important, and, and it's within this kind of forum that we can start to have discussions of how we develop a tax taxonomy for these different kind of levels of understanding what it is that the patient wants. Hi, I'm Larry Green from uh, the University of Colorado. Uh, I come to the mic to uh, affirm what you have said and also with a request. Uh, the affirmation is uh, one, of the, one of the verses of my own career was uh, to chair a, a Department of Family Medicine. And while in that role, uh, the uh, somewhat natural proclivity of people all across the Mountain West to think that the department chairs would be the best doctors that they could go to. I, I knew, of course, this was not true. Uh, but that did not uh, preclude my life being uh, regularly punctuated by someone who had seen many doctors, and sometimes in many countries, uh, trying many therapies, many treatments, on many drugs. And over the years, what I learned to do was uh, uh, to not do anything at first other than listen and usually at that point it was a paper record collect a uh, stack of papers and I would tell the patient uh, after they exhausted themselves in telling the tale that I needed time to look through their record and did they find them and uh, they would and when they come back we would pick out what medicine to stop first and second and third. After the second one, I could send them back to their regular doctor, and they would say I was a fantastic doctor. But all I did was to stop doing. Uh, so you're just brilliant, and you just articulate so much, so well for all of us. And that leads to my request. Uh, it, I, I'll direct it toward uh, Norm Oliver and Tom Bansagi and you, I want this entire talk available to me to show to others. Oh, thanks, Larry, for your kind, kind words. Um, I think I think what your comment highlighted was the importance of the interaction, the relationship, and the conversation. And it's really interesting, it, it's sort of um, thinking about these ideas of how we make visible patient priorities, um, of the importance of the conversation. There was a really nice study done about a year ago, and it looked at, at just these kind of domains that we're all trying to grapple with for asking patients about their priorities. And it was a trial of, of asking about these, getting people to record them on an iPad, and then the, the placebo arm was getting them to record something about their lifestyle. And this was fed forward into the consultation. And the results were, were was surprising, but when you think about it, not surprising, because what it did was it decreased empathy in the subsequent consultation. So actually, it's in the narrative around these things um, that, that the importance lies, not just in their recording. So thanks for just prompting that thought. Sean, Sean Tracy from Toronto. Merci beaucoup. You ended your talk with a quote from one famous Canadian, so I might offer another. The great Canadian physician William Osler once said that perhaps the feature which most distinguishes humans from other animals is the desire to take medications. It's true. It's true. So on this challenge of polypharmacy, and you, you alluded to this, I think it is a very real risk that patients will perceive the discontinuation of medicine as the discontinuation of care. And I think perhaps the negative outcomes of that are even greater than the negative outcomes of the polypharmacy itself. 
So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how we can minimize that risk. I think it's a, an honest discussion of um, that, that integrates sort of what, what they want from care and, and being realistic about what the care can provide. For example, we need to provide evidence across all cause mortality and, and morbidity for them to make decisions rather than just saying this will reduce your X and Y by 15%. But I think it's also um, important that this, that these are not decisions that we make, that it's for the patient, that it's a decision that the patient comes to themselves after reviewing this kind of, of evidence, and that each patient will make different decisions. They won't always be the same. But I think you can, re 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 this is the, the ultimate form of personalised medicine, which is I think a term that we need to claim back for primary care, is that, is that we can say to patients, just as drugs work different in, differently in paediatric populations, they also work differently in older adults. And we're doing them harm by not providing them with this boutique and individualised approach. And they kind of understand it when you explain that they've probably won the cholesterol race if they've, you know, got to 75 and they don't have any heart disease. So I think it's about sharing this information that we have that's starting to trickle to patients through the media but ought to be trickling through through our, our conversations. And I think the other, um, the other important thing about, about the process of addressing this is that, um, is that it's framed not as a, a kind of a dichotomous thing, we're going to stop these drugs and then kind of put, push you out into the world. That it's, it's starting a medicine is often the end of a shared decision-making conversation, but it really should be a lifetime conversation. And there are periods through the patient's life we should be pausing drugs, monitoring, observing to see whether they're still of benefit or not. And then, but always with the option to uh, agreed criteria under which we might restart. And under those kind of conditions, I think patients um, uh, aren't fearful of, of entering into these kind of conversations. I see our call. Oh, okay, John Hickner uh, from Chicago. A very short story of successful deprescribing 20 years ago. A friend of mine, a geriatrician family physician, took over a nursing home as medical director. Average number of meds was 9.6. After 18 months, he had safely deprescribed, and the average number of medications was 4.6. Uh, this was 20 years ago. So it can be done. Yes, we need trials, but I think it's time to get started. Enough evidence. I can remember last century when I was a uh, resident on a, a geriatric ward and uh, when we presented the patient, we had to explain and justify in detail if the patient was on more than five medications. So I, th I think we understood this from a long time ago, but we seem to have lost it somewhere um, en route. Don Dees from Colorado. Hi, Don. Um, the, thank you. Um, thank you for this very, uh, this, this reminds me of um, the good old days at NAPCRAG, um, of really challenging uh, the dominant paradigms. And I, I, was, I was glad that you brought up Heidegger, but you didn't quite go where I thought you might be going with Heidegger, because Heidegger um, as was really the, the father of phenomenology. And I think that is the philosophical root of what we're talking about, but most of us work and uh, live and breathe in institutions that are monuments to Cartesian uh, methods. And I would dare say that many of, um, much of our work that gets presented at this conference is rooted in Cartesian sort ways of thinking, looking for the universal truth. And I'm just wondering how we can, how we can really uh, get back to our, um, our roots with Heidegger, because that's really where we're at when we're in that room with the patient, and how we can um, really begin to mine the methods that theoretical physics and now biology are starting to come to, which are moving away from Cartesian methods. I agree with you um, again entirely. Um, it's nice to hear these questions because they're very affirming. Um, 
one of the slides I took out actually was, was exactly to that point with a, um, a statue of Rodin, um, Rodin made of an, an old woman. Um, because I think, I think we are well placed in primary care because we are one of the, one of the disciplines that does integrate both the, the biological Cartesian and the humanist sciences. And I think it's, it's that that's needed to, to really move forward. And I think it's quite a powerful thing too if we want to, to translate um, these results because stories are such a, a powerful thing for translating knowledge. So, uh, so I agree with you. And I think I see around in conferences like this a wonderful mix of, um, of the measurable and, and the meaningful. Leif Solberg, Health Partners. Um, you appropriately and very nicely described the role of the primary care doctor in helping individuals deal with the polypharmacy over medication use. But I guess uh, it seems like we also need to be aware of the, and do something about the guidelines that have uh, led us to some of this situation. Uh, best exemplified, I think, in the last week by the change in hypertension guidelines in the US, which are going to, um, uh, in a one stroke, raise the number, the, pro the proportion of people who are labeled with hypertension by some 50%, most of whom are going to be my age or older and uh, are gonna be subject to all of those side effects and problems that you described so well. So thank you for highlighting that, but I hope we can also do something about the cause. I think we can, together. And um, yeah, the, the hypertension guidelines are interesting because half of older adults are gonna be classified as, as having hypertension and about 75% of, of um, those at 75 uh, or older. It was interesting when I looked at that guideline, there was not a single primary care physician on either the, the main group or the reviewer group. So it, it really is something we have to do something about. And, and looking through the 400-page document, um, during which you'll probably lose to the will to live before you actually find the evidence on which it's based, <coughs> um, there's not information, the information in there to enable shared decision-making conversations easily. So I think, you know, collectively as an organisation, we could, could have a voice. It's Fred Burge in the back here. You can't see. I know you can't. I see. I just want to say thanks. Um, that was amazing. And um, the notion for me about clinical courage is one that I've been thinking a lot about as I get older and how we role model that with residents and other clinicians. And I, it felt for me as someone actually who studied at McMaster during the great era of the introduction of evidence-based medicine that we've forgotten it. Um, and, or it's been taken from us. So how do we get it back? I don't have the answer. The answer is probably among us um, as we work and respond collectively. But I guess the question is, what are we really afraid of? What's the worst that could happen? Hi, um, uh, Stephen Wilson. I'm, I'm over here on your, what would be your left, I think. Um, the president of the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine. Um, I could take time echoing all the, the positive comments about your, your talk that everybody already uh, just said, uh, but I just wanted to um, mention one of the things that was really standing out is this notion of fear. And um, those guidelines that just came out, I think a lot of people will follow them out of fear. The people in this room largely know that there'll be not much value in terms of in impacting mortality and morbidity. In fact, it might negatively impact mortality and morbidity. And if, you, if we talk to each other, we will bemoan the guideline. But I think out of fear, people will go home and conform and practice according to a guideline that they know is likely to not do much benefit population-wise and, and individually. Um, so I think one of the things that, that I would uh, take home from, from your talk and, and we'll try to resonate more with myself and, and others is, is this notion of, of uh, not being so fearful and just doing what we're told so that we can continue X. Um, and also the idea of reclaiming the, one, of the, one, of the one of the legs of the 
of evidence-based medicine about the patient. It's the, the stool's falling over because we've made that leg too small and you really challenge this to, to make that leg equal again with the others so the stool can be back in balance. So I thank you very much. I think, um, you know, one of the responses to, to, gut, to fear and guidelines like this is, is that all of our regional professional networks can make public comment and, and critique when documents like this come out and point out the conflict of interests in the, in the, um, the people that created them and their unfitness for, um, you know, for our patients. And, and also to remember, I mean, I know that the US can be different and I don't understand Ex the, the detail of the litigious nature of the US. But, but in general, the, stand the guidelines aren't standards that we can be accountable to professionally. We're accountable for the standards that, that our peers set, so a reasonable group of peers. And if we as a reasonable group of peers have said these are not um, standards for care, then that gives us maybe a little more clinical courage. Yeah, I think we've used up all our time, so thank you very much for your <laughs> attention.